Well, that was a very popular song back in the 1960s. And uh, I used to sit in my car with my 8-track and I'd sing right along. But today, it's become the song of the professing church. And it's so sad that we are the great pretenders. Please stand and we're going to read the word of God found in John chapter 10, verse 22 and 30. I want to share with you all, this is my dad's ring. I don't feel worthy to bear his name. nor wear his ring, but I'm wearing it in honor of him. So I'm not here to bling you, blingy, but I'm honoring my dad. At the time of the feast of the dedication took place at Jerusalem, it was winter and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of the Solomon So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you did not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Father, today we ask you in the precious name of Jesus that you would glorify your great name in this place, and those who are here and listening, and those, Lord, who are watching and listening By other means, Lord, that you'd speak to every heart. Lives would be changed for your glory. Father, Lord, we would consider in these very troubling days exactly where we are in relationship to you. So, Father, please, Lord, it's too dangerous to pretend. Way too dangerous. And we praise you, Lord, and we thank you in Jesus' lovely name. Amen. Well, I think you know this girl right here. And uh, Amaris, do you know that girl there? She's gone to sleep? Okay. Oh, she's in children's church. Excuse me. Yes, uh, but anyway, that's Amaris with a big grin holding on to the chair. But she's four years old. She'll be five here shortly. And having a a four-year-old granddaughter in the house, we do a lot of pretending. We have a pretend horse named Spirit. Last night she came up, she said, uh, Spirit's here. So I held up my hand, I went, woof, woof. And she turned around and said, Run, Spirit! <laughs> I mean, she yelled, Run, Spirit. Papa's gonna lasso you. Run. We have that pretend horse. We have a pretend lasso. She said, I have a lasso too. So she raised her arm and did like me. And she said, I've got him and you can't get him. I said, my lasso's bigger. And she's looking at, of course, nothing there. We pretend that a little stuffed lamb is alive. And this little stuffed lamb is named Lammy. And Lammy's voice is Debbie's voice. Lammy speaks because Debbie says the words for Lammy. And this little stuffed lamb, dead as a doornail, does amazing things because we pretend. We have a pretend tea party. Well, at least it doesn't b- bother me. The caffeine in the pretend tea doesn't bother me. It doesn't cause my blood 
uh, pressure to go up. But we pretend. All this pretending is harmless. And it's a lot of fun. We old folks, we enjoy this crazy stuff. And uh, it's lots of fun. But in the spiritual realm, pretending is extremely, extremely dangerous. It's not harmless, but rather eternally dangerous. Hell's mouth is open wide to receive all pretenders. Hell's mouth is open wide to receive all pretenders. And the professing church of our day is full of them. Are you one of them? Am I one of them? Are we pretenders? Jesus said, Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, the day of judgment, Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Now what he's saying is I never knew you in an intimate, personal, living, vital relationship. He knew them. He knows everything. But he didn't know them in relationship. I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Then in the message, the same passage reads, knowing the correct password, saying, Master, Master, for instance, isn't going to get you anywhere with me. What is required is a serious obedience, doing what my Father wills. I can see it now at the final judgment, thousands strutting up to me and saying, Master, Master, we preach the message. We, ba we bash the demons. Our God-sponsored projects had everyone talking. And do you know what I'm going to say? You missed the boat. All you did was use me to make yourselves important. You don't impress me one bit. You're out of here. Out of my presence into the flames of hell. Are you a pretender? Am I a pretender? You see, we have here in this passage that I just read to you two groups of people. They came up to Jesus and they said, how long are you going to keep us in suspense? And these are the people that are the spiritual elites. They're the ones that everybody in, in the Jewish nation would look up to and think these, these are the the spiritual elites, they're the top dogs. They're, they're the ones who are the most spiritual. And I, know, I hope you notice that Jesus said, you do not believe because you're not one of my sheep. Believing doesn't make us sheep. We believe because we are sheep. Believing doesn't make us one of his sheep. We believe because we are one of his sheep. Given to him by the Father before the foundation of the world, we are one of his sheep. And he said, you don't believe because you're not among my sheep. You're not one of my sheep. So he's telling them, you're, you're, you're out. You're not one of my sheep. But he said, let me tell you about my sheep. You look at a sheep, but you don't live like a sheep. You attend, you sing, you read the Bible, and sometimes you pray and you give, but you're half-hearted in all these things. It's all pretend. It's all pretend. We have people in church today, and they've gone to church so they can pretend. I'll go there, and I'll, I'll do my thing, and I'll be present, and... I'll be counted for, but just pretending. You're neither cold nor hot. You're neither cold nor hot. Lord, in this day we live in right now, we need some hot Christians. We need some people on fire for Jesus. Our culture is crumbling around us. And don't you think, because you live in Macon County out in the country, 
Because what happens in the big cities comes out here too, eventually. It's coming. We're neither cold nor hot, but we are lukewarm, and, you, and we make him sick. God is sick. He tells us in the book of Revelation that lukewarmness makes him sick. And he's going to throw the pretender up and throw the pretender out. He's going to vomit them out into the flames of hell where there's no escape, there's no relief, and there's no end. Please, I beg you, don't go there. Don't go there. Please don't go there. I plead with you. You're just one breath away and one heart breath away from the flames of hell where there's no escape, no relief, and no end, and you keep dilly-daddling, you keep putting things off, and it's critically important that you come to Jesus now. Not think about it, not wonder about it, not think, well, I'll do it later. Right now is the only time you got. Do it now. Come to Jesus right now. The real sheep are described by Jesus. He said, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Well, there's three things here. Hear, they hear, they hang, and they heed. They hear, they hang, they heed. They hear, they hear my voice. This book right here, please, I want you to understand Today we got people all over the place saying, God told me this, God told me that, God said this, God said that. This is the voice of God. This book is the voice of God. Now, you say, Brother Harold, doesn't God subjectively sometimes lead us and guide us? Yes, he does. Every time I go to preach, I'm experiencing the sub subjective leadership of the Lord. Because he didn't say in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, Harold, on the 30th day, you're to preach on John 10, 22 through 30. It's not in here. It's not in here. So I'm led by him subjectively. But I want you to know something. The way you and I know whether the subjective is true and whether the subjective is real and whether the subjective is not of myself or from hell is by knowing the voice. You know this book, and then when somebody says something, or you think you heard something, you'll know whether it's from him or not. Old blind lady sitting in her house. Her grandson is reading the Bible to her. And he's reading a passage, and suddenly Granny said, Stop, son. You back up and read that again. God don't talk that way. And you and I, when we hear somebody say something, that God told them this or told them that, we can say, Stop. God don't talk that way. Because we know the voice of God. We know the word of God. We know the scripture. Objective word of God. And it keeps the subjective part safe. Safe. But see what we've got today, we've got everybody over here in the subjective, and they're ignoring the word of God. Lord, help. I hear some of the craziest things that are purported to be Christian that totally go against God's word. So you have subjective leadership. You have that. I totally agree. I experience it all the time. But I, I guard and I gauge it by what God has said in his word. In his word. Please be careful. Please be careful. They hear my voice. This book is his voice. We don't need a subjective word. We need a scriptural word. Now, I'd accept a, a, a subjective word, but I, I want a scriptural word. I'd rather have one verse than any vision. Are you listening to me? I'd rather have a verse 
than a vision. Does God use visions? Yes, he does. But I'd rather have a verse than a vision. So, those who know the word of God know when it's not the voice of the shepherd speaking. The devil speaks, he's trying to drive you. And he wants to drive you into despair. When the Lord speaks, you know. He's not trying to drive you. He's calling you to himself to do something for his glory. Number two, they hear my voice. Number two, they hang. Now, I don't mean hang by a rope until they're dead. I mean they hang out with him. He said, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them. And what he's trying to say here, I know them in an intimate, personal, living, and vital way. They are in a relationship with me, and I'm in a relationship with them. We hang out together. We talk. I speak to them. They listen to me. They speak to me in prayer, and I listen to them. We have a great relationship, and we have a great fellowship with the living God. His sheep are in an intimate, personal, living, vital relationship with him, and they hang out with him. How do we hang out with him? In worship, in prayer, in praise. They hide the word of God in their hearts that they might not sin against him. Their greatest fear is displeasing him. We got a church today, a professing church today, that is absolutely horrified at COVID-19. Horrified. Is it dangerous? Yes, it's dangerous. But folks, everything around us is dangerous. It's danger everywhere. Everywhere I look, there's danger. But when I look at God, I know he's got this. He's got it. He's got it. Can we get sick? Yes. Can we die? Yes. We can, but God's got it. He's got it. And when I close my eyes in death, I'm just going into a much greater and more awesome place. That's what Paula did. I was praying, Lord, please sweetly, gently, tenderly, painlessly, Take Paula into your presence. I prayed that same prayer for my father. Lord, please. Listen, folks, death is not the enemy of the child of God. Lord, have mercy. He's friend number one. When he comes, we go. But we go into the arms of Jesus. As I told you, goodness and mercy are pursuing us. That Hebrew word doesn't mean just hang around back there, just sort of hanging around, following along. No, they're pursuing us. Goodness and mercy is pursuing us. And when you die, one of them gets this shoulder and the other one gets this shoulder and ushers you into the very presence of the Lord. Praise his name. When Jesus had spoken these things, he raised his eyes to heaven in prayer and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so that your son may glorify you just as you have given him power and authority over all mankind. Now glorify him so that he may give eternal life to all whom you have given him to be his permanently and forever. I'm sure glad I'm in that number. Now this is eternal life that we may know you, the only true and supreme and sovereign God, and in the same manner know Jesus as the Christ whom you have sent. So what is eternal life? It's knowing God. Intimate, personal, living, vital relationship, knowledge. And Jesus Christ whom he has sent. So they hang Number three, they heed. And he said, they follow me. 
Jesus said in John 14, 15, if you really love me, you will keep and obey my commandments. I used to, when I was ministering to a large number of young people, I'd say, how many here love Jesus? Raise your hand. Everybody raise their hand. <clears throat> I said, put your hands down. How many here obey Jesus? Oops. Oops. Maybe one over here. Maybe one over there. But they wouldn't raise their hands. But I asked them the same question. If you love me, you will keep my commandments and obey my commandments. John 14, 21, I love this verse. The person who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who really loves me. And listen, and whoever really loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and reveal myself to him. I will make myself real to him. Some people say, well, I just don't know. I gave my life to Jesus, but I, I don't know much more than that day, and I don't know much more about him. Listen, dear ones, as we obey him, as we love him, he and the Father manifest themselves to us. They make themselves real to us. Wow, we, what an awesome thing. All right, in 1970, of course, I, I know that's ancient, but in 1970, uh, I was in Cumberland University in Lebanon. I was a student there. Just out of high school, graduated in 1969, out of high school, started there at Cumberland. Pre-law, going to be a lawyer. And uh, a veteran was there who was enrolled in college and in my class, and in our class also, there was several young, pretty girls. Took notice of that. Well, this one girl, she was absolutely infatuated with this veteran. They were together all the time. They were holding hands most of the time. And what she was doing, she didn't say a whole lot, but what she was doing, she was listening to his war stories. He had been decorated. He had several honors, medals, and uh, had served in several campaigns. And so he was, uh, he was telling her all about that, and, and he, he was very gifted at telling the stories, and she listened to everything. And she was just overwhelmed and amazed, overwhelmed and amazed at his stories. Well, we go into the, I think back then it was semesters, and I think we go into the second semester, and one day I come into the, the college building where the classes are held, and I see her, and she's hand, head is in her hands, and she's squalling. Well, I thought, you know, maybe they had a spat or something. I don't know what was wrong, but anyway, a little bit later, she's walking down the, the hallway, and uh, she's still squalling, and of course, you know, you want to know what's happening, what's going on, but the veteran wasn't there. Well, see, what had happened, the school found out he was an absolute liar. He had never been a soldier at all. He had never served anywhere. He never fought in any campaign. He never received any medals. And every story he told was an absolute lie. He was a great pretender. Well, the ones who's going to cry one day is not going to be the people that we have deceived. But the one who's going to cry one day is us. We're going to cry because we're going to hear him say, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity, because I never knew you in an intimate, personal, living, vital relationship. Oh, you did this and you did that and you did this and you did that, but it wasn't from the heart. You see, that young man at college had the art without the heart. 
And we have multitudes today that profess to know Jesus that have the art, sing, pray, give, do, serve, but they don't have the heart. And like the old preacher said years ago, they're going to miss heaven by 18 inches. That's the difference between here and here. They got it here, but they don't have it here. Do you have it here? Do I have it here? Is Jesus dwelling in you by faith? Or are you, am I, a great pretender? Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day and your kindness, your love, and your mercy. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. And I pray, Lord, for everyone who is here today and everyone who's listening. Lord, in this day of pretending, Lord, we would see that it's not going to work. Lord, times are going to get rougher. Situations going to get harder. And Lord, I want there to be enough evidence if I'm arrested for being a Christian. I want there to be enough evidence to convict me. Be overwhelmingly enough evidence to convict me. Not, Lord, that they'd have to scrimp around and try to find and not come up with enough to cause the charge to stand. Oh, God, help us, Lord. We quit lallygagging. We quit our half-heartedness. And be all for Jesus, all for Jesus. All our beings, ransomed powers. Everything. For the one who gave everything. And we praise you in his lovely and holy name, Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Love you. Uh, what we'd like to do, if you would, join Leroy here, you men, dear brothers, and uh, everybody sort of stand up. We're going to scoot the chairs over, go get some round tables. Uh, fellas, we're going to put six chairs to a table today instead of eight chairs. A little more room little more space okay anyway follow Leroy and y'all please help him get those tables if you have any questions about the message I'm up here I'll be glad to talk to you if you have anything you'd like to ask I'll be glad to share with you thank you very much